there's a restaurant in the Union Station called the Thunder Grill. I don't know that I could recommend the food to you, <laughs> but I would recommend it to you as a place that has become for John, Kenny, and I a holy place. Because John has made many trips over this last recent years, and more so since we decided to do this initiative, from Richmond to the Thunder Grill. And Dolores has left Philadelphia and gone to the Thunder Grill. Dolores eats, and John teaches her. And so it is a remarkable honor, privilege, and with love, I present to you John Kinney. It was John's very forceful and wonderful conversation that made me realize the gifts of black theological education. And so Amy and I took a trip down to Washington together because I wanted her to know about the Thunder Grill. And John tried to wiggle his way out of doing this opening. <laughs> he tried every way he could to say no to me, but he couldn't. And so I am pleased to present to you my brother in the Lord, my friend, my mentor, and even a guy I love, John Kenny. <laughs> Thank you. God bless you. Honoring the God of creation who privileges us with this moment. Dolores is absolutely correct. I made every argument that I possibly could to suggest that um, I had had my opportunities to stand before our gatherings in times past and uh, that I was overexposed. <laughs> but she insisted. And so we receive this moment with gratitude. God never gives moments without purpose. And our fundamental responsibility in our doing is to never function in a fashion that our behavior or our existence hinders the fulfillment of God's purpose. And that the evidence of success is that the powers of eternity can celebrate you as a partner in purpose and not a hindrance to the fulfillment. So that's my prayer. May I be a partner in purpose. And I know that uh, my friend Dolores will keep me on time. It says address, but you all know that's not what I do. <laughs> my passion is teaching. <laughs> I read a w book once that says, teach like your hair's on fire. And one of the things it says, how do you expect a learner to get excited about what you have to offer if you can be passive and disconnected in its delivery? If you aren't fully present in the teaching moment, why do you ask them to be present? <laughs> In a recent book, Healing Our Divided Society, Investing in America 50 Years After the Kerner Report, in the introduction, the report says, in 1968, the Kerner Commission concluded that America was heading toward two societies, one black, one white, separate and unequal. Today, America's communities are experiencing increasing racial tensions and inequality. Working class resentment over the unfulfilled dream, the violence of white supremacy, and toxic inaction 
in our leadership and the decline of the nation's prestige and status around the world. The dream has been deferred. <laughs> Langton Hughes asked, what happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up <clears throat> like a raisin in the sun or fester like a sore and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat or crust and sugar over like a syrupy sweet? Maybe it just sags under the load. Or does it explode? Kenneth Clark in Dark Ghetto is a sociologist talking about the black church. He said the black church is where people of color gather to embrace and launch a frontal attack on the realities that negate their being and their person. If ever we needed black seminaries, it is now. At black seminaries is where we find the strength not to run, not to stink, and not to surrender, not to implode or explode, but to run on just a little while longer, believing in a future that is not defined, determined, or destined by the toxicity of our communities, but by the power, grace, and continued investment of an amazing God who has brought us safe thus far. And so when my brother Michael says <laughs> endurance, <laughs> it becomes an anchor in the community. Now I have to be honest with you, I've struggled with how truthful I can be in this moment. And I'm gonna be honest, I'm gonna have to mask some of the things I would like to say because this is not the context to say it. If you study the theologians in the midst of Nazism, like Bonhoeffer, they would make statements like this, you are not required the truth to speak truth to somebody who can't handle the truth's purpose. And in the language of our ancestors, if you read in the folklore and stuff, they would, what, how I would interpret it is, a truth becomes a lie when, where, and what you speak will have to help the master maintain his chains. So even though you may speak truth, you're lying if it supports the maintenance of the chains. I have, on Saturday, on Saturday I will enter my 72nd year. I have a birthday coming up. I am not as insane as Ed Wheeler Or Dolores Brisbane. <laughs> but I began my investment in theological education in 1969 as a student. And it was at Virginia Union, there were some folk who said, you need to go further. My first contracted theological position was the teaching assistant and tutor assistant in the theological department of Union Theological Seminary in New York. And I had primarily to serve James Cone, Tom Driver, and Bev Harrison. And now I have been doing this teaching. My first contract was in 1976 at Virginia Union. I left to go to Chicago. And while I was away, I understood what it is to be recalled 
or for your call to be clarified. And there at Chicago Theological Seminary where I had an excellent and wonderful experience where one of my students was and one of my fellow learners was Frank Thomas. That I was privileged to share remarks at his licensing into the Christian ministry. To God be the glory. But it was there that I realized my call in education was to a historically black school. And if I didn't serve a historically black school, I was walking away from my calling. Even though my advisors were telling me the exact opposite. What happens when black folk tell you don't waste yourself at a black school? And so I've been investing in this and I've been privileged. I've been so privileged because I can look out there and see folk who have nurtured me, poured into me, given me the privilege to graze on the fringe of insanity that I'm prone and enjoy to do, enjoy doing. <laughs> nope. Mm -hmm. I can look out there and see my, my co-pastor for many years. Micah McCreary, we shared a ministry together. Hmm? And now he's the president of New Brunswick Theological Seminary. We, we literally pastored a church together in Negro Foot, Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> Called Negro Foot because in the legend, this is where the appendages of runaway slaves were cut off and hung in the trees to remind anyone that freedom is not an option for you. And there in Negro Foot, <laughs> we work together and make it a freedom center. <laughs> Congratulations, Micah. So I come here with a deep sense of gratitude. Anyone who is blessed and doesn't say thank you is diseased. Amen. That's, for me, the, in, in the story of the ten lepers, you can be benefited and still be very sick if you can't go back to the one who benefited you and say, thank you. And too often with each other and with God, we reap benefits, but we never say thank you. And while we believe we're well, you're walking with the evidence of a deadly disease. So I have to say thank you to so many and I hesitate to call names because there are too many here. But I do have to say thank you to Marsha Foster Boyd. Some of us know what you went through, sister. Don't apologize for my tears. <clears throat> but I do apologize for not loving you as much as we could have. Thank you. Now, even the tears are part of the gift of black theological education. And I'm way past the day 
allowing other people to steal my authenticity because it doesn't fit in the box they want to put you in. This is part of the <clears throat> amazing gift of black theological education. I've been blessed to go to seminaries from Florida to Minnesota, from California to Maine. I've been able, folk have invited me to come. When I first started doing it, I wanted to go there to be what they wanted me to be. But I grew to the point that the best thing I can be for them is to be me. And I respect the gift in every one of those schools I visited, but the deepest pain is that the schools I visited who would invite a black presence didn't always respect the gift in black theological education. And some of them even create arrogant black folk who think they're superior because they didn't go to a black school. And sometimes even as the teachers, we are so conformed by the toxicity in which we are formed <laughs> that we believe we're superior because we can teach for them. And sometimes even organizations that are, say they're going to support black folk will make a preferential offering option for black folk who don't go to a historically black school. And I thank God for foundations. My first job at the School of Theology was made possible by the Lilly Foundation. I would never gotten hired at the Lilly Foundation had not funded education for leadership in the black church. I was the first director of that program when I went there. And it shows you something about my theological career and trajectory. I went there to create options for people who were being excluded. So we developed the weekend program in 1976, taught two classes. Hmm? And the other part of it was developed a program for the education of lay people who could not get into seminary. 212 people came to the lay program, 12 came to the weekend program. First two classes, history, Christianity, and homiletics. Come on. When I became dean in 1990, one of the first things I did was to make the weekend program huh, a complete degree program. And I was blessed to have a committed faculty who would say, yes, I will teach in the evening. Yes, I will teach in the and I'm not asking for any benefits. We just arrange this schedule. So to come to Virginia Union, you know you're going to have to teach when the students need you, not when you're comfortable. I'm going to be honest with you all, because I told you I don't dress. I'm, talking, I'm tired. My dean can tell you I'm, I got a heavy load. And if I could really talk about the gift of black theological education, I wish you could have been in my class yesterday. When you were together and seen folk, black people cry is the pain of their study is even self-convicting. Do you understand? Seeing them laugh and see them dream and see them hang out, you know, even though I got to leave to catch a plane to get here, they're staying there to talk about what this class meant. This one class session meant for what they needed to do when they went back in their ministries and how they had to stay connected. Yesterday we talked about theological anthropology and talked about the tragedy of how black people are being formed in an orthodox theology that commences from a deficiency position. That is is it begins with their deficiency and their negation rather than the celebration of their being. And they come into the world as sinners and lost rather than as magnificent gifts of God. And then they go to school to be taught orthodoxy. And then black people get so psychically distorted, they shout when somebody tells them they're a worm. But that's good. Theology. If you could have been there, I was tired, but they, they, 
They invigorated me. You know, we have a program. I had to go to my dean. Listen, this is what black theological. I had to go to my dean and I said, Dean, I got some folk in the program who, if we could double them up this term and do a special things next year, some of them could graduate next year. And but in order to do it, we've got to offer this theology class this spring. I said, Dean, can we offer the class? He said, Well, um, John, I don't think it's a problem, but then he asked the dean question, who's going to pay for it and who's going to teach it? <laughs> but, guess, but guess what I said? Dean, I'm already teaching the class in the evening. I will teach that class this week. Not asking for something more, but at this black theological schools, we are so committed to what we do. Anything that we can release to benefit the people we teach will be released, even at a sacrifice. And I tell folk, if you're not ready to sacrifice, this isn't the place for you to work. This is where we give ourselves to a purpose and a task. It's our calling, not just our job. And I have to acknowledge, as much as I praise Lily, sometimes when I look at predominantly white institutions getting these huge grants to study black life, to do what we do every day, and we can't get a grant to do it, because they'll say, you're already doing it. But can I push it even further? If you're going to give them a grant, why don't you encourage them to celebrate the gift of black theological education and say we will not fund you unless you link with a historically black school? Because that type of approach, what? Encourages and maintains the superiority because they begin to believe we're the center of black life. So I thank you for this invitation. I hope I don't say anything that. <laughs> I'm going to do like I tell the, the congregation where Mike and I shared uh, was, huh? Uh, now I'm going to say something, but you know, I love you. <laughs> I, the verdant possibility of this moment is rooted in the moment that Amy suggested that we had on the campus of Virginia Union. Because it's interesting that in trust guides the process with six historically black theological seminaries. And when I saw in trust stand up in this room, But the beauty of it is, they, <laughs> that what immediately might raise the question, I begin to discern, was a part of a holy evolution. Because they had the wisdom to really say, guess what? We got the stuff but we ain't got the stuff. <laughs> and they had the wisdom to hire a capable but centered, spirit-celebrating woman who ain't scared of none of us. <laughs> oh, I said ain't, I apologize. Who is not scared of any of us? <laughs> And I thank God for that. But I want to show you what happened in Virginia Union that would be instructive. Because what happened in that moment, we began to share. Hmm? Alton drew us into our African roots. And the Africa in us began to move. And whenever you get to your roots, 
all of the walls that the world tries to build and create between black people start crumbling down. And we didn't became, become different schools. We became a people in search of a vision. And then I was privileged to say something, but I got to say this to Amy and Jay. They were the only two persons in the room who, have, who had experienced some degree of melanin deficiency. <laughs> but here's what happened. They were so authentically present that their presence did not hinder the movement of the powers. Here's what I'm saying. Anytime the spirit is moving and the promise of the spirit is in your midst, you can introduce a non-conductive element that hinders the transference of the power. Sometimes your very presence diminishes the possibility because you got an attitude. Do you, and sometimes the non-conductive elements can be of any color. And the promise that is in us is constantly being impeded because you have a negative non-conductive presence and the power wants to move and take you somewhere else. But you keep grieving the power. So Jay and Amy, I got to acknowledge, could that have been a moment where God brought us to a state of witness that exposes the possibilities that there are in creation if we can get beyond the issues of power, dominance, and control. So I just accept that what you have been called to is bigger than you and me. Dr. Walker, my dean, y'all know my dean? <laughs> my dean helped us crystallize where we move with the comma, learning, living, and leavening. The learning was, and the important part of our discussion was, the learning begins with the self-critical assessment to recognize where we have been captivated by colonialism in our own institutional patterns and structures. You can't somebody live, set somebody else free when your own function e evidences the chains of the master. But then we said, here's the key piece for me that I think we neglect. Our learning, and I'm talking about examining our, our, our faith, ex using resources that are drawn from the story of people who have been on the journey and have an alternative lens for interpreting reality, possibility, and the condition of existence in our world. But then there's living, and that's what I, the, great, the greatest gift, if we can ever capture it, that if you really are learning black, you gotta live black. And when you start living it, it means that the way you operate, and here's where I get in trouble, even the policy you write will be anti-colonial. Brian said there's only one way. That means all black schools are even different. But uh, Lawrence Levine in Black Culture and Consciousness uh, examines the Herskovitz uh, Frazier debate about survivals, and he talks about why that's you, you have prejudiced the discussion already because you've made culture something that is static and can be handled in a package when what? Culture is static. And even though you may be of different places, he talks about there can be a style of living, <laughs> come on, and a worldview that's consistent across your dis differences. Mm-hmm. But none of, we're not going to be the same. And, and can I say this? That's why I'm not impressed with other folks' benchmarks. They don't have my mission and don't live where I live. 
and what the same thing you teach a young pastor what don't you ever bring something in your church in because it works somewhere else you got to do the analysis what of your own location and situation and then what happens when the way that we begin to evaluate people it, with a benchmark that is not appropriate for the context because can I tell you something if you want to be sure that you fail let other people define your mission and how you do your work. I love you. <laughs> but the seeds of this writing project, now let me make sure I got, you, you got my time, right? Yeah, I'm going to pull your coat. Okay. But I think I'm all right, aren't I? Okay, because we started early. So that means I can go longer. No. <laughs> the seeds of this moment, you all, hey, brothers and sisters, the seeds of this moment were, are not in this grant. The seeds of this moment were, is in our black writing project that we were working on. And one of my great disappointments is that we allowed something external to make our enemies internal. Did y'all? In other words, there was something going on outside of us where we ended up engaging each other and not the problems we were trying to address. And the characteristic way of to strip the power of the black community is to for an external to create internal division. And we start fighting the petty and the personal rather than the purpose, living for the purpose and the promise. And then there are those who think they can reduce the black experience to an objectivistic monism where it's a formula and we can package it and now you can bring it to your house And you can do what they do. You just missed me. You, uh, you understand what I'm saying? You just, in your desire to engage black folk, you just violated black folk. Because you have reduced blackness to a commodity that is portable. And you can use it for your service. And it's always bigger and more. Because ultimately, it's not a way of doing, it's a way of being that bursts another form of doing. And if you're not ready to be, don't think you can do. And in those moments of gathering, something happened. Do you all remember the last biennial? Come on. Where we were supposed to be dealing with race? Huh? And we all had our hearts broken because that became a moment of self-glorification by people with a colonialistic mo moment. They didn't engage racism. You use it as a moment to tell how they had been against the racism. And in my tradition, we did this and we did that. And then they reduced the overcoming of racism to simplistic relationship. You love me and I love you and we'll all be. I, I didn't hear anyone say the presence of black people has forced us to rethink how we do what we do. What you're really saying is, I welcome you in, and using the language of the late Jim Washington, you welcome me to you to a theological circle, then you commit soul murder. <laughs> Naeem Akbar said that we must be very careful, you all know what Naeem, <laughs> an Africological psychologist who said, we must be very, very, very careful in the where and when we send our children to learn because black people have not been educated, they've been trained. 
And whenever you are trained, you are being equipped to serve somebody else's a purpose and to negate the gift that is in you. All of us are familiar with the book of Dream Unfinished, Theological Reflections of, of, of America from um, the margin in there. And uh, there are ultimate things in, that say, to be accepted, you have to be no people. <laughs> mm -hmm. And Manning Marable, you know, you know what he said? He said, you have to study and write a language that is not your own and think thoughts that don't come from you. <laughs> You could have been in my class yesterday. Could y'all find that? Could you get us? Couldn't do it? Okay, all right. I was trying to get a picture of it. In my class yesterday, when we're teaching about theological anthropology and the difference between seminal transference, whether through biology or federalism and uh, environmental social transference of sin, how does sin get to another person? Dominant orthodoxy says what? The sin is transferred by And someone like Reinhold Niebuhr uh, rejected that because he says sin is not what? It is not a necessity but an inevitability. His is much more social. But the bottom line is the orthodoxy says that you're sinful by birth. So where is the, where is the sin? In your blood. And then you construct a Christology to resolve the lie you made up in your anthropology. Come on. And we're wrestling with this. And I said, can, can I show you? Can I help you understand this? So I asked them to Google square watermelons. Do it right now. Somebody Google square watermelon. Square watermelon. No, I'm not, I'm not the director of this. D Dean Walker is. That's, that's, he's, he, so next time you've been a vice president, dean, and director of all things moving on. <laughs> no, 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 come on. Did anybody find it? You got square watermelons? If I ask you, what's the shape of a watermelon? You would say round or oval. Then why is it squared? Because it has been put in a plexiglass block to alter its nature so it conforms to so somebody else can use it for their purposes. Come on, y'all miss me. Come on, work with me. See, there's a seed in the watermelon. There's a design in the watermelon. But the watermelon, they said, because it was round, they couldn't stack it and ship it with efficiency. And it's difficult to cut. So therefore, in order to commodify the watermelon in a fashion that it has greater utility for my purposes, instead of letting it be who it is, I'm going to square it. Y'all miss me? So when black folk come into a racist environment, immediately they're put in the plastic glass box and said, don't dare you dare be round. I need you to be square so I can stack you and slice you. Did you, did you hear what I said? Now, this is why we got to be careful. Because if we aren't careful, there will be external enforcers moving on us to the degree in order to be legitimate, you're going to have to get in the box. Come on. And I, my, my executive director, ATS, is here. But I'm retiring. Yesterday I was talking to a few days ago. <laughs> you want to know the truth? Any of y'all read that art, excellent article? Dean shared it with our entire community, even our lay community, when we had a conference. Everyone, why seminary? Powerful. But if black seminaries are encouraging seminary experience for the people who lead black churches, when are we going to redesign ourselves to serve the people who are leading? Oh, y'all miss me. See, you, you're living with a contradiction because you say you want them theologically educated, but the masses of the people that are going to be serving those churches, you won't even let through your door. You know, so I was talking, Corey, you know I'm still crazy, okay? 
I was, talk, I was talking to some, some old preachers, and I would say, yeah. And they would say, Doc, I heard you step down. I'd say, yeah. And he said, what would you do if you do over? I said, no, I, I, one of the great things about living, you don't get smarter. You recognize how stupid you've been. <laughs> I don't feel like I would. No, no. I recognize more and more every day I could have done things differently and better. But I don't have to apologize for my fidelity in the journey. You understand? Yeah, yeah. I said, the bottom line is, if I was designing a seminary right now, hmm, I would take an intentional notation on admissions. Because I would have a model of admission that afforded me the privilege of allowing discernment to help me understand who should be in seminary. And if I had pastors who've been pastoring 10 years and are successful, have built ministries, come on, come on, huh? and had a career perhaps in another discipline, you will take a, somebody out of college, wet in the, out behind their ears, never did anything yet, let them in, and here's somebody who's already demonstrated in their life for 30 years that they have leadership skills, knowledge, and capacity, and you tell them, but you don't have what it takes. I would take a notation. Hmm? I would have to place myself at risk for the sake of my people. Because I want them theologically educated. And a certificate program is not where many of them need to be because they have the gifts and the capacities to do this. But you know what the problem is? It makes more work for us. Those students who haven't been formed, you can't make assumptions. Do you all know when you talk about megatrends in the church, one of the things is that when you educate in the church now, you got to move from tribal education to immigrant education. You cannot assume that people who come to church know anything you're talking about because people are not being formed in the church anymore. They're being formed in the street. It's the same way for me when it comes to theological education. you got to stop acting like everybody's going to know this and assessing based upon what they know, but become the teaching center and help folk are leading the church Get the knowledge that you have. And if you don't help them, then you're violating them. Maladome, what did he say? So may, what did he say? The more you know, the more you are responsible for serving your community. And if you're blessed with knowledge and you're not giving it to as many people as you can, then you are not worthy of the village. Mm -hmm. Here's what we have to be very careful. That if we don't, <laughs> I love you, we got to be careful that we don't start putting black books and black titles in the same square. Oh, y'all didn't hear me. See, we think we've gone black because now you're going to read this. But if you're in the same square, you're charcoal lies Eurocentrism. And you're not providing any other kind of different education. All you did was change books and titles. When do you say we will not look like that anymore? And too many of us, can I say this? Because we have been trained in the square, the only way we know how to assess scholarship and the way we do something is with square theology. And we use the same standards, same way of assessing, same way of interpreting that the square taught us. I confess my guilt. Come on, I confess. Why? Because when I first started teaching, I taught them like I'd been taught. Come on. So we studied Paul Tillich, huh? Come on, Reinhold Niebuhr, huh? Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Karl Barth, huh? And then I sprinkled in a little James Cone. That made it black. No. <laughs> no, huh? Or I'd be put in Henry, uh, 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 David Walker's appeal to Henry Highland Garnett's address to the slaves and read a few little, you know, poems and yeah, now, now we black. <laughs> no, you not. Because the structures, the, the information may be different, but the way of being is the same. And uh, I don't know, maybe you could. The evidence that I read the last time I looked at all the data and listened to Dan Alshire before he left, he said the future of theological education is going to be much more about the formation of people than it is just the information you provide people. Why? Information is available everywhere. Come on. See, it used to be in order to get the information, they had to come to you. Shoot, they can, they can, they can assess every professor in the world 
And if all you're doing is giving them information, they already got that. Somebody has to be forming them and shaping them. That's the gift of black theological education. Um, Steve, when we were in Rochester, you mentioned Ronald Dorman Somay's book, and I said, what? Because this one, you hear something you said, that when he was in the seminary, he said, my greatest pain was not the cruelty of white people, but black-faced people who had the white man in their bellies. And he said they were just as cruel and insensitive huh, to my person and my being as the other folk were teaching me. But they were all what? Well-trained. Now, if you would permit me, I'm going to be a little more personal. I won't, don't have time to do everything. Y'all always know I over-prepare uh, because this is when the stuff starts flowing. The issue, can I, the gift of black theology, a black theological school, and we've used it, Ed, Alton, we do subversive scholarship. We're not here to reinforce the box. We're trying to crack this thing. But the good news, if black folk will do that, the benefit is not black folk. The world will be a better place. The church will be a better place. Humanity will be transformed. Why? Because some black folk dared to be black and be faithful. I recru recruited multiple students. Can I back up just for a minute? When we had that moment, at that ATS biennial. You all remember we went, after that we went and had lunch together. We went back and all of us met. In that moment, what happened? We cried. Come on. And Leah Fitzhugh wrote a part when grown black men cry. And can I say this without insulting anybody? We have not thanked her enough. We have not thanked her enough. No matter what you feel or think, we not, it was her passion and her drive. <laughs> I'm not apologizing. I cried. Not everybody cried. I cried. Ed Wheeler cried. Is it okay, Mary? Mary, who's been was my partner for almost 25 years. And I thank her for how she blessed my leadership in my ministry. Everybody in leadership needs somebody you know you can trust. That they don't have an agenda. Because they not only know you, they know your heart and why you do what you do what you do. And you can speak truth to them and it won't be used as a lie. I could speak truth to Mary. Thank you, Mary. My desire is she wouldn't be at ATS. Never mind. <laughs> uh, no offense, I love you, praise the Lord. <laughs> no, 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 no. In all seriousness, we cried, but everybody couldn't cry, and that's okay. That's okay. But the problem was, is when I came back and I was talking to a young scholar, and I said, you know, a couple of us broke down because our tears of grief actually were transformed, huh, Virgil, into tears of triumph. Because after we felt the pain, we began to share testimonies about how, where God had brought us from. We went all the way back before we had PhDs and how God made it open doors. And we start crying, not because of somebody else's failure, but because of God's goodness. Huh? Hmm? But you know what pained me the most? It's when I shared that story with some young scholars. They said, oh, you shouldn't have cried. Because you know, if I cry, Somebody's going to question my emotional stability and the depth of my intellect.
One of the tragedies of what the box does to you, it coerces alienation, separation, and internal fragmentation. So you have to separate intelligence from emotion. You have to separate spirit from scholarship. Come on. You have to separate even the educated from the uneducated. And can I know one of the real problems is that in the, oftentimes in the academy, even though you're a friend with somebody, ultimately you want to destroy them because you're all fighting to move up in the ranks. Oh, y'all didn't hear me. See, so therefore we live in a competitive environment where I even have to other the people I work with so that I can move up in the ranks. And then we sit around and take shots at each other because they don't quite fit the box that justifies their rank movement. <clears throat> hmm. There are four things that when I was privileged to lead the school, and I thank God that it was clear it was time for me to go. There, you, you can read the signs and you, mm -hmm. things happen when you're leaving that you never thought would have happened. You can't believe how people, hmm? But, I, but Virginia Union is blessed, and I'm blessed. Why? Because I have a gifted young man who has a vision. And I have intentionally, what? Almost act like I'm not there. I just teach my class. Why? I was dean for 27 years. My very presence in some places can affect the process. I just stepped out and let him lead. And he's doing an awesome job. You understand? Amen. <laughs> no, that's my public confirmation. But some people don't understand. Where are you? I am being where I need to be to make sure that the new dean has all the space he had needs to be who he needs to be. Do you? Hmm? But... Four things when I was dean, I say to anybody who comes to Virginia Union and why we grew as a school. Number one, we are black people and we don't apologize for loving God. When you come to this place, you are coming to a place of worship, devotion, and faith. We will never coerce you to a position in the faith, but this place is built upon a relationship with God. And the only reason we're here is not because we've been so smart and not because we've been so good, but there's been a God who has been faithful because if you understand this, our story, it's a miracle that we're still here. I want to apologize. How often? I even heard this when I was in school. Leave that God stuff out there. Don't bring that up in here. You never have to jettison God in order to participate in a learning experience. We love God. We love God. And I'm a dean because God has called me here, not just because this institution hired me. I'm here because I said, yes, Lord. And it's gotten to the point that even black schools want to mask the fact that they have a faith center. Oh yes, just come here and learn. You know, we do we reflection. <laughs> We're almost afraid to let somebody know that I worship. Why? That's the box. That's part of that separation that, that separates scholarship from spirituality. Some of you all heard the lecture that I did at the Proctor Conference that what? The Holy Ghost does not countenance ignorance. The Holy Ghost does, does not cause you to lose your mind. It expands your consciousness to the degree you're able to think thoughts you never thought and dream dreams you never dreamed and see visions you never saw. In other words, the Holy Spirit is not saying stop being a thinker. The Holy Spirit is says surrender yourself to me and I will show you that there's capacity in your consciousness that is lying dormant. And if you ever honor me, I will release it and you will be able to produce what you have never produced. Don't bring down that Holy Spirit stuff up in here. No, I, I'm, I'm, 
I'm getting too comfortable with you now. <laughs> no, no, we love God. Y'all, I'm, I'm sorry. If you meet me, say he was ignorant, huh? Say he didn't do this, he didn't do that. But I pray that you'll always see, be able to say, whenever I was with him, I saw the face of God. I experienced a presence. Can I tell you what I teach my students? Your greatest hindrance to an anointing is your arrogance. The spirit cannot anoint arrogance because arrogance has made you God. And God can't give you more when you think you've already arrived. <laughs> no, no, I love God. But then you know with the second thing, is I tell every student, anybody in here, my, uh, my, my, I can tell you, anybody. Second thing is, uh, anybody I hire, I tell them the same thing. I'm not going to curse what denomination or anything you do, but this is a center of faith. Second, we love God with our mind. We're not going to love God in a fragmented way. We love scholarship. And the classroom is a place of worship. It's sacred enterprise. Study is a privilege. Mm -hmm. And so we sometimes we just celebrate the presence and power of God, that God privileged us to have this moment, that study is not antithetical. Come on. Huh? To loving God deeply, it is driven by that love. And I give God my mind. And we don't fragment. We don't split the reality. Because there's going to be some days you're studying. Can I tell you? Can I give you an example? Yesterday I'm teaching. And one of our alums comes up the steps, looks in the door, and waves. And when she waved, I said, oh, come on in here. Come on in here. Tell them who you are. And she told them her name and said, I just, I just got assigned to a church, an AME church, and a blah, 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 blah. But then guess what she went on to say? She went on to say, this place is going to bless you. You're in a blessed zone. Huh? Hmm? Now, the critical thing, though, but when she left, it created a spirit in the room. Because, see, where I studied... That would have considered an impolite interruption of the educational process. At Virginia Union, that was the teaching moment. At black schools, I welcomed her into the space, and she was able to make her testimony. And the people who didn't even know her were able to do what? You got a card? <laughs> <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> huh? 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 But you, what happened was after the class, because we were dealing with Jesus Christ. And someone says, that's a Christ moment. And they said, Doc, you could have said to her, and you said, One of the big gifts of black theological schools, while other folk tell black folk, we say, and here's the other, one of the students who had been to another school, <laughs> come on, and is from the Chicago area. He said, because Doc, if you'd have done this to her, you would have just told me what you were going to do to me. Oh. It wouldn't have been her. I, was, I would have internalized what? That's the way y'all going to treat me. Because as soon as you get my tuition, <laughs> the power of the place. Do you understand? We love scholarship. I tell you, can I make it plain? This thing I'll tell them, I tell them, and we love black folk. If you come here, I don't care what race you are, don't expect us to alter our commitment to black folk cause you're here. We're going to be who you, we are. Huh? Hmm? The, we, we love black people. But I said, that's good news for you. Because the way we love black people, 
We participate in the insurrection of subjugated knowledge where those people who have been viewed as lacking the appropriate specificity and scientificity to be used as a database for theological construction are now welcome to the theological circle and you don't just have to read the books that we tell you to read. We want you to have a conversation with your grandmama. Guess what I just told you? Your story matters. So I can recruit someone who's not black by telling them how black we are. Because they're now coming to a learning environment where all truth is not external, coming from somewhere else. A lot of it you got to process through you. And there's value in your journey. And all learners are looking for somebody to help them understand there's value in my journey. And particularly with adult learners, they want to know that you affirm and appreciate what you br they bring to the learning process and not just what you think you're going to pour in them. I had to fly up here. My class is still in session. But guess what they're doing? They're in groups preparing for Friday where they have to do what I call a pew seminar. You know what a pew seminar is? After we've studied all these theological doctrines, they have to lead a seminar with a pew. What's the pew? P stands for prophetic praxis. You've got to show me how you can use this theological concept to prophetically engage an issue fighting black people, facing black people and our world. Secondly, you have to prepare an educational outline as to how you would teach this doctrine in a local congregation or in a setting outside. Come on. And the W is word or witness. Show me how you would preach it. How, would you, how, how do you turn what you just learned in theology into a sermonic moment? That's the integration. And if all they're doing is passing a test and can name the right names, if they can't take what they learned from uh, our time of learning together yesterday and take it where it can make a difference, then my, our time was wasted. We love you, and we love study. Huh? We love black folk. But guess what? You know what the final statement is? I love you. You matter. Not a part of culture. Denise, wait, raise your hand. See Denise over there? That's Denise. Denise is associate professor of Christian education. Huh? Amen. Uh, while all living human beings on the face of the earth, based upon the latest genetic studies and the analysis of mitochondrial, mitochondrial DNA analysis, all living human beings on, on living on the face of the earth are, have come from one mother. Amen. And they're not saying that's the only mother, but she's the surviving mother and the most fruitful mother, and she just happens to be an African. So I cannot say that she has no African uh, ancestry in her. <laughs> but she's... She's not a black American, an African American. But guess what? She'll tell you, when I hired her, I said, you're coming to a black school. And because you're coming to a black school, as your dean, I will love you and respect you because the standard of how we care for you is not derived from how other folk cared for us. Am I not? Huh? And I said, Denise, I got your back. But guess what? You are at a black school. And guess what my challenge to her was? As long as you don't hurt or harm the formation and the development of black students, I don't have a problem with you. You hurt one of these students, and we got a problem. So, Denise, hmm? and you all don't realize how black she done got, man. She <laughs> In other words, I don't care. It's, it's not her race. But are her commitments and does she really love black folk? I don't want anybody teaching my children who don't love them. I don't care whether it's in preschool or in grad school. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> so anybody who comes there, they're going to know what, what you matter. Now, guess what that does? As the leader, it creates immense amount of work. Huh? Come on. Why? Because when they come through the school, I meet them and I tell them this. When you come here, failure is not an option. If you were somewhere else, they might not care if you fail. But if you fail, I fail. And here's my commitment to you. I will stay up all night if I have to tutoring you to make sure you don't fail. And if you make the same commitment, failure is not a possibility. 
because it's never their failure. It's our failure. No, no, I don't care. I cannot accept it. You know, I'm the one I take that responsibility on. And can I, that's why I'm tired. My wife talks to me all the time. Amen. She even fussed at me. Why are you teaching that class? And guess what? She, guess what she said, and I got ready to answer. She said, no, don't, you don't have to answer. I know. <laughs> I said, just give me three or four more weeks. And I'm disappearing for a month, Dean. <laughs> y'all heard it? Y'all say, say it's not? Did you see him do this? Is that on the camera? We got, we got it right here. We got, that's right. We have data. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, that we love you, and I'm gonna, I'm, I, you know, there's, the, the, there's so much more I have on this paper, but I'm gonna leave it alone. I'm gonna leave it alone. But here's something that um, people say: What's your mantra? You know, what my mantra is: Love, listen, learn, lead, and lift. You can never lead people you don't love. And people will never follow you if they don't know that you love them. Do you hear? You know, and that may, that may sound strange. But I've discovered. Can I share something with you I haven't shared with many folks? The first thing that I did when I became dean, I just went out and met all the many pastors as I could and asked for their opinion of Virginia Union. Come on. And one of the moderators told me something very powerful. He says, well, Dean, I support you out of duty, not out of love. And I said, why do you? He said, it's hard for me to love somebody that I'm not sure they love me. Hmm? Come on. And you all, the next year he sent a donation. Why? Simply saying, thank you. And that love starts shaping how you think. And the real question becomes, where have I not loved these people the way I have the resources and capacity? And it doesn't take money. It takes will. When we developed ours at Virginia Union, our, our grant was called what? A Culture of Generosity. Denise, when she came to us, and I discovered that she had used to work in the development office at Northwestern? Huh? What did I say? Huh? My wonderful Nubian sister. <laughs> no, no. I said, look, we've talked about what it means to be here. And now that you're here, we need more than what you're given. Because you have something you can release here. And she jumped right in and was a tremendous asset. Because sometimes we got proposals and had two weeks to turn them around. And her gifts and skills in grant writing. Thank you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now, well, what, I, what, what, what I say is that, that, you, that you love. Everyone knows you love. People say, yeah, no, you can't, you can't lead in love. No, you got to be lead, no, love. Then the next thing I always say is listen. Listen before you do stuff. Listen. And here's a very critical thing for me that helped me. When I was very young in my deanship, I went up to Harvard to go something in Harvard to have, it was in the Harvard area, in the, in the Cambridge area, and we were having, it wasn't had nothing to do with them. It had to do with, um, uh, we, we were talking about church growth, right? But in the break, you were allowed to go in to the business conference where they were talking about revitalizing failing businesses. And guess what they say the key to revitalization was? Clarity of mission. Clarity and commitment to your mission, huh? And service to your clients. Oh, y'all miss me. And sometimes we don't serve our clients. Our primary interlocutors are somebody else telling us to do what we need to do, and we do it to serve a need but not our clients. And that helped me, Chris, because I didn't know nothing about management. <laughs> no, I'm seriously, I, I had managed places, but to look at some of these principles. And that, and that helped me. So what? listen, listen, and never listen and not learn. And if you love, listen, and learn, you position yourself to lead. 
You know what my final L is? Lift. You cannot lead complaining. You cannot lead with a negative attitude. You cannot be the voice of failure, defeat, or come on, you got to ha always have a word that says what? We're on our way. And I get so tired, because I heard it a lot of time in my tenure, of folk talking about we in the survival mode. If you are in survival no, no, mode, you are writing the obituary. You should always lead to thrive, not to survive. And raise the question, why are you not thriving? Come on. Not how do I survive? Because how do you survive is a concession to what's going on that keeps you shrinking. Lift. Dream. And talk about how do I take what I have? This is where ATS helped me. Because I, several years ago I went to that co a conference and they talked about mapping your assets. And they were talking about schools that were in trouble. And the consultant said, you're in trouble because you don't know how to measure your capital. You got capital that's not in the bank. Come on. You got capital of what? Expertise. You got network capital. Come on. Huh? You got reputation capital. When do you use that to generate revenue? And I came back and said, we need to develop a cultural generosity because we got a lot of capital that we're not investing in our clients. Uh. Come on. And part of it was to expand what Dr. Bond did so magnificently for us for years, uh, for a, a few years. And that's what? Hmm? A center of lifelong learning and leadership where we just, we just gave ourselves to the communities. <laughs> and he started First Fridays on the campus where you just bring people to the campus and study. Don't charge them. Don't. Just come here and receive. Uh -huh. And guess what happened? Give and it shall be given unto you. Press down. Uh -huh. Whenever you try to get, get more by shrinking and what? Holding on to it, you're going to get less. Lift. 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 Um, I'm, I'm through, but I'm on. Can I tell you? Any of y'all ever heard the story about letters from Timmy? It's, I think her name's Elizabeth Ballard, called Letters, Three Letters from Timmy and Other Letters. It's a school teacher, and she collects the letters of, uh, of the students that she taught. Now, it's in Appalachia, and there are multiple iterations of the story, and they're embellished in various ways. As far as I could, could see by my own research, it's not true. This is more, it's, it's fiction developed for devotional purposes. And anything in here that appears to have a suggestion of correlation with any particular individual or event is not intended by the author or the speaker. <laughs> no, 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 no. In the story, she tells a story about a man, a little boy named Timmy Stoddard. Timmy Stoddard um, was a student in her third grade class, and he was doing very, very poorly. His personal hygiene left much to be desired. He was a dull student. Children made jokes about him, you know? And come on now, be honest. The teachers even talked about him and hoped he wasn't in their class. That happened, y'all. Hmm? She said Timmy was in her class and he was doing terribly. He was just doing terribly. And she said at Christmas, the kids brought gifts and everybody opened up their gifts. Timmy gingerly brought his up last and she opened it up and it was a bottle of perfume that was more alcohol than fume and the gold in the bottle had flecked off into the the liquid and he brought some say a bracelet others say a brooch with all the rhinestones out of it when she opened it the kids start laughing she had the sensitivities of a teacher and guess what she did she put the brooch on, opened the perfume, and she said, I told him goodbye and have a Merry Christmas. And then she says, all of a sudden, I felt the presence of somebody in, in the room. She said, I turned around, and it was Timmy. And she said, Timmy, go home, son. Merry Christmas. What you doing here? And Timmy said, Miss Johnson, I need to tell you something before I go. You need, 
you really made this room smell like my mama today. And she said, I went back and checked his record because I hadn't done. I was just li I was basing my response to his person based upon somebody else's interpretation and story. Come on. And she said, I looked back at his record and he was being, his mother had died before he was five years old. He was now approaching nine and he was being raised by a single parent alcoholic father. She said, after that moment, I went home to my house, got down on my knees and rediscovered why I was a teacher in the first place. And she said, after Christmas, everybody who came into Miss Johnson from that day forward, anybody who stepped into my room was treated like they were somebody. And everybody was somebody. And she said, I just start taking time with Timmy. And the minute I took time, what? His grades start going up. And she said, he passed my class. I didn't promote him to get out the room. He did what was necessary to pass. And then she said, I didn't hear from him. About two or three years later, she said, I got a letter from him. It said, Miss Johnson, this is Timmy. Do you remember me? I was in your class. And I just want you to know that I'm going to middle school and I passed. She didn't hear from him again. Three or four years later, he got a letter. Said, Miss Johnson, this is Timmy. Miss Johnson, this is Timmy. Uh, I'm graduating from middle school. Miss Johnson, I'm getting ready to go to high school. And Miss Johnson, I'm number 47 in my class. <laughs> Come on, look. Got another letter four years later. Miss Johnson, Miss Johnson, this is Timmy. Do you remember me? Well, I just want you to know that I am graduating from high school, and I am the top 10 of my class. <laughs> Hurry, got another letter four years later. He said, Miss Johnson, this is Timmy. I don't think you might not remember me years ago, but I'm graduating from college. And Miss Johnson, I would like to report to you that I'm number six in my class. <laughs> Thank you, Miss Johnson. She didn't hear from him again for six years. She got a letter from him and said, Miss Johnson, I'm not sure you remember me. I hope you've gotten my letters. But Miss Johnson, this is Timmy Stoddard. And Miss Johnson, I am graduating from med school so you can soon call me doctor. And Miss Johnson, I just wanted to let you know I'm number one in my class. Now look, here's the thing that gets it. Then he said, Miss Johnson, in four months, I'm going to get married. If I send for you and bring you here, would you come and sit where my mother would have sat? Because you made the difference in my life. You created kingdom space. Y'all didn't hear me. The gift of black theological education is most manifest and most powerful. It's when we can take people who have been brutalized by racism and not negate them, but provide kingdom space. And if we aren't providing kingdom space for black folk, and if we can do it for black folk, that means we can do it for everybody. And here's my question is, if people step into my classroom and don't experience kingdom space, then why am I teaching? Thank you. Oh, you're okay. <laughs>